right. Okay, we're getting close to the end of Crash. I hope you're enjoying it and enjoying the changes in Crash. He's becoming a little more sensitive, a little nicer uh, to his sister. And we're going to see if he continues that way or goes back to the old Crash. So the last time we read yesterday, um, Penn had been doing sprints past their house seven days a week, every night. He is running, and we're not quite sure why. And that Scooter keeps saying, all he can say is a bye. But to him, it's everything. because It means everything. It's the answer to everything. So at least he can feels like he's communicating in some way. So, chapter 39, March 22nd. Something happened in English today. A couple weeks ago, we got an assignment. Write an essay about someone you know. Tell what that person means to you. I wrote about Scooter. Not about the stroke and the rehab and all that. Just the good stuff. I told about the great cooking and the stories in bed and how he came to all my games, even in the rain. The papers were due today. When I got to class, Webb was already there wearing the old peace button. DeLuca was there. I took my seat. Webb got up to talk to the teacher. As soon as that happened, Mike went into Webb's desk and snatched some stapled sheets of paper from it, probably Webb's essay. I figured on... I Probably Webb's essay, I figured. On the way back to his desk, he crumpled it into a ball. When Webb got back, he saw right away what had happened. He started looking around frantically for his essay. Under his desk, in his books, kids were giggling. Suddenly, while Webb's back was to him, Mike turned and whipped a paper ball to me. I never didn't catch a ball that was thrown to me in my whole life, so I caught it. The bell rang, everybody settled down, class started. The teacher didn't ask for the essays right away. As the period went on, I got more and more curious about Webb's paper. Finally, as quiet as I could, I uncrumbled it. I flattened it against my desktop, shielded it with my book, and read. One of the most important people to me is my great-grandfather, Henry Wilhite Webb III. I feel very fortunate and blessed to have a great-grandfather, but he is more than that to me. He is 93 years old. It is hard to believe that someone who is 80 years older than I can understand how I feel, but he can. He is my best friend. Henry Wilhide Webb III gave me my first name. The year, 1919, he ran for his college track team in the famous Penn Relays. Shortly after that, he traveled west to the state of North Dakota, and he settled there and raised a family. But he never forgot that day at the Penn Relays. When I was born, my mother told him that he could name his first grandson, he named, he named him Penn. That is me. He moved to Pennsylvania seven years ago. I have only seen him once since then. I miss him so very much. Most of all, I miss the stories that he used to tell me about the old days. Sometimes he tell, it makes me sad when he says that he feels himself disappearing like the prairie. My great-grandfather is coming to visit us for two weeks in April. He is coming then because that is when the pen relays take place. He says he wants to see them one last time. I do not believe he knows that middle school and even grade schools now compete in the relays. I believe the best gift I can give my great-grandfather would be for him to see me run in the pen relays. That is why I've been practicing my running every night. The teacher called for papers. I passed mine in. The bell rang. Everybody packed up. Webb took one last look around the desk. While everybody else headed for the door, he headed for the teacher. I intercepted him. I stuck the essay in his hand. I found it. I said to him, it's wrinkled, but it's okay. He was gapping at me like a hooked fish as I went out the door. Track sign up is tomorrow. So another good thing. So Mike took the paper from Penn um, without Penn knowing, and he gave it to uh, Crash, thinking Crash would you know, kind of keep the joke going. Crash read it, and obviously it touched his heart because he's talking about his, grandfa his grandfather, um, his great grandfather, and you know he wrote the, his whole article. Penn did. There's his whole paper about his relationship with his grandfather, and obviously we know what kind of relationship Crash has with his grandfather, a very good one, and how much he respects him. So it's kind of given them uh, a bond or something that they have in common. All right. Chapter 40, April 2nd. I was in the kitchen this morning checking out the refrigerator when I heard screaming outside. No, go away, scam. I opened the back door. Abby was in the yard holding a garden shovel like a baseball bat. In front of her was the chem lawn man with his white jumpsuit holding the end of his hose that snaked back into a can-shaped truck parked in the curb. He tried to reason with her. He told her that it was important to spray the ground now that all those evil weeds wouldn't have a chance to get started. 
But all Abby did was snarl, plant, murderer. Go spray that stuff on your hair growing out of your nose. The guy wasn't stupid. He didn't move. He knew if he did, he'd get a shovel across the kneecaps. He looked at me, but I saw, but he saw I was laughing too hard to be of any help. So he backed off, reeled in the hose, and drove away. Tonight, my father paid Abby a little visit in her room. I heard him ask her what did she think she was doing. Daddy, she said, he was killing the weeds. This may come as a shock, he said, but that happens to be the whole idea. Well, it's a bad idea, she said. We have to have them or we can't be an official wildlife habitat. Last time I checked, this was a home, not a habitat. Daddy, daddy, lecture coming. You were brought up all wrong. It's not your fault. Weeds aren't bad, Daddy. Weeds aren't even weeds. They're plants and flowers, just like dandelions and all. They have a right to live, too. How would you like it if a truck came and sprayed poison on you just because somebody thought you were a weed? Next thing I heard was my father going back downstairs. Chapter 41, April 12th. Most big kids are slow. Most fast kids are little. That's where I'm different. I'm big and fast. In sports, I most like I most like to beat people by plowing them under, like football. And next year, I'm going out for wrestling. But in the spring, there aren't any contact sports, just baseball and track and field. So I use my speed in track. Even though it doesn't look like it, track is, is kind of like football. Sure, there's no ball and no shoulder pads and nothing in the way except the string across the finish line. But you can demolish a kid just as much by beating him in a race as by plowing him under on a football field. It's about the first thing you do when you're little. You race. And the kid that wins, bam, right away, he's the fastest, he's the best. Walk into any neighborhood anywhere in the world and ask some kids who's the fastest one there, and right away, they'll tell you. They'll point to him. It's something everybody knows. It's a title that goes with you on the street, your school, your town. Fastest kid. That's me. We had race-offs today. The top three will run the 100-meter dash in our first track meet. I won. I beat the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th graders. The coach says he's surprised at how fast I am for being so big. He was also surprised at who came in second, Webb. He said he can't remember the two fastest runners ever, both being 7th graders. I wasn't real surprised at Webb. I still remember that time we raced to the mailbox and back and how close he was behind me. In the race off today, he got a great start. He was out ahead of everybody. I guess he's been practicing his starts too. But you don't beat Crasher the Dasher with a great start. I caught him at the 50 meter mark and the rest is history. You can hardly see the mouse house anymore. It's deep in the brushes. There are leaves piled up around it and the windows have pink flaps over them cut from an old wash rag. But still, there's nothing living there. The Kemlon guy hasn't been back. Chapter 42, April 15th. Jane Forbes came up to me after lunch today. She was mad. She stuck a scrap of paper in my face. Did you do this? Did you write it? Huh? I said. I took the paper. The words were in big black letters, all caps. If you ever want to see your turtle alive again, be sure you eat meat in the cafeteria on Monday. I will be watching. Where did you get this? I said. Penn gave it to me. Did you? I gave the scrap back. No. And I don't, and don't go around accusing somebody unless you got proof. I walked away. A little while later, we had our first track meet against Donner. In the 100 meters, Webb was out fast again, and again I passed him halfway. Me first, him second. I didn't even wait till the meet was over. I didn't take a shower. I got dressed and ran all the way to Mike's house. His mother let me in. She was in his room. I went up. She said he was in his room. I went up. I didn't knock. I just barged in. He looked up from his 18-inch TV. Where is it? I said. Where's what? He said, like I was a loony. It wasn't out in the open. I looked under his bed. Hey, man, he squawked. Only junk under the bed. I went to the closet, checked the shelf, checked the floor. There it was, in a computer paper box. I took out the box. I lifted the turtle and took it over, and turned it over. There was the name Thomas carved in the bottom shelf. You didn't even have food for it, I said. It was a joke, he said. I would have gave it back. I'll save you the trouble, I said. He stepped in front of the door. How come all of a sudden you're nosing up with Webb? Move, I said. He stayed put. He's feeding you oat burgers or something? I didn't answer. He thumped me on the chest. Huh? Thumped me again harder. Huh? I stood still as a rock. I knew what he was doing. 
He wanted me to thump him back, like I always did. Locker room buddies stuff. He thumped me again. Huh? I thumped him back, only it wasn't what he expected. The heel of my hand hit him square in the chest and sent him butt first down the hallway floor. He ended up against the bathroom door with his Christmas sneakers pointing at the ceiling. He forward rolled to his feet, fists up, nose flaring, but he didn't come any closer. For a long time, we just glared at each other. Then his fists went down, his shoulders drooped, his voice whined. What's the matter with you? Figure it out, I said. I went downstairs and out of the house. I took the box with the turtle to Webb's. I left it on the back steps. I knocked on the door and ran. My father went to mow the grass, but the spark plug was gone from the mower. Chapter 43, Scooter came home today. So it's great. So many things are going on in, in these chapters. Um, make sure you go to the question and answer um, about Crash and his changes. And um, do you think Mike will figure out what's wrong with Crash? Do we really know what's wrong with Crash? What do you think Mike did? So I want you to think about that, and then we'll go and um, you can go and answer the question. So... Have a great day. See ya.